Thanks for tuning in to Ascending Lotus. This is our YouTube channel. All right. This is actually part two to the birth certificate tutorial. So if you guys have been around, um, you see that I've shown you all how to get the certificate of live birth from your state department, um, as well as the county uh, birth certificate. Now, why do we need to do that? Why do we even go the, the, uh, the extent of getting the certificate of live birth? understand that I have to share a little bit of information with you all also in this video I'm going to show you step by step the process that I do in order to make sure that I can get uh, the certificate of live birth authenticated um, as well as you may need to authenticate other uh, documents that you may have you know legal proceedings where you need authenticated record of um, and just to give you guys a heads up any title of ownership you may want to go ahead and authenticate that way you have uh, followed the necessary steps to have perfected your security interest in said property okay um, whether it's a title whether it's a deed it, I mean anything uh, it could be similar as a title to a car anything that you're doing uh, where you're acquiring assets it will be uh, on the safe side to go ahead and perfect your security interest in that by authenticating the records okay now we're talking about authenticating our certificate of live birth in order for us to see the rule or uh, where that is we need to go to Minnesota rule 220 and this is talking about birth certificates alright so I'm gonna read along um, it should pop up and you can follow along with me now rule 220 states and this is general rules of practice Rule 220, birth certificates. The Registrar of Titles is authorized to receive for registration of memorials upon an, any outstanding certificate of title an official birth certificate pertaining to a registered owner named in said certificate of title showing the date of birth of said registered owner, providing there is attached to said birth certificate an affidavit of an affiant who states that he or she is familiar with the facts recited, stating that the party named in said birth certificate is the same party as one of the owners named in said certificate of title, and that thereafter the registrar of title shall treat said registered owner as having attained the age of the majority at a date 18 years after the date of birth shown by said certificate. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this. Um, so let's take this piece by piece and we're going to identify and break down certain things so we can understand why um, it may be in the best interest of some people to to go ahead and authenticate the birth record okay because uh, there's there's a lot of notion out right now where people are saying oh you know don't attach yourself to the to the straw man or don't authenticate the birth record uh, however there isn't a lot of um, there isn't a lot of information on why people are are, are trying to not uh, authenticate a record that is attached to um, to them and everything that they do. I mean, whether that's the social, they're using the social, they're they're using the birth certificate uh, for employment, right? And it's hard to navigate the commercial waters without um, without the birth certificate or your social, okay? And so to hear people say, "Oh, don't do that," um, there isn't any any reasoning back behind it. And so what I'm showing you here in Rule 220. Um, is the breakdown okay and so register of titles is authorized to receive registration of memorials upon any outstanding certificate of title and official birth certificate pertaining to a registered owner now what is the registered owner who is the registered owner well the natural person would be the registered owner or if you convey it into a trust that would become the registered owner all right if the trust is underneath your control as you as the trustee or you as the grantor of said trust okay and so we have to understand in order to fully take control of that birth certificate and that estate um, the authentication needs to be done okay and so um, the registered owner name is that certificate of title showing the date of birth of said registered owner providing there is attached to said birth certificate an affidavit of an affine who states that he or she is familiar with the facts recited so once it's authenticated 
there then needs to be an affidavit attached to the final authenticated record of an affiant who states the facts that he or she, um, the registered owner, has in fact taken control and possession of said birth certificate or that bond. All right. Now, what does this mean when this happens? So stating that the party uh, named in said birth certificate is the same party as one of the owners named in said certificate of title and that thereafter the register of title shall treat said registered owner as having attained the age of majority. So is it safe to say that maybe we are still in a minor or minority, all right? And remember, minor is, is not only just uh, based upon age. If we go and look up the law de uh, definition of minor, you'll see that there is also uh, a, a few other implications in there that we'll uh, go ahead and post and show so that you see what a minor is in law, okay? And so this is telling you that once a person authenticates it, the register of titles will then um, make note that this person is actually at the age of majority, okay? And able to govern their own affairs, all right? So I've thrown out a couple different words like possession and control. Okay, and so we have to understand once we've authenticated the record, you know, what is the rule behind it if we're going the route of becoming that secured party, all right, and being a creditor and not a debtor, okay? And so to get to the bottom of that, we're going to look at the Uniform Commercial Code 9-310, all right, when filing required to perfect security interest. Now the question is, do we need to file a UCC financing statement uh, to perfect our security interest, all right? And for some things you will need to file, but for some things we may not need to file, and there are other stipulations that actually provide proof that you are owner, okay? Now, let's take a look at it. So UCC 9-310, and we're going to start with general rule perfection by filing, all right? So except as otherwise provided in subsection B and subsection 9-312B, a financing statement must be filed to perfect all security interests and agricultural links. So that's the general rule. However, there are exceptions. And so B is stating that filing is not necessary. And we're going to take a look at B, then number 5. In certificated securities, documents, goods, or instruments, which is perfected without filing or possession under section 9-312E, F, or G, uh, we're going to look at number six. It says, in collateral in the secured party's possession under section 9-313. And then uh, number seven, in a secu certificated security which is perfected by delivery of the security certificate to the secured party under section 9-313. So these uh, five, six, and seven is, is, that, is specifying that if there is a secure, uh, certificated security, as long as that person is in possession, all right, when we're talking a natural person, the register owner, as long as it's in possession, you're not required to file. Okay. Um, number eight, it also states in deposit accounts, electronic chattel paper, investment property, or letter of credit rights, which is perfected uh, by control under section nine three one four. So letter of credit rights, that's perfected without filing. Okay, and the main thing is just it being in your control or the uh, authenticated birth record or the authenticated certificate of live birth being in your possession. Now let's go and take a look at section 9-311 alright and this is titled perfection of security interest in property subject to certain statutes regulations and treaties. I'm going to read A where it says security interest subject to other law except as otherwise provided in subsection D, the filing of a financing statement is not necessary or effective to perfect a security interest in property subject to, I'm going to read one, a statute, regulation, or treaty of the United States whose requirements for a security interest obtaining priority over the rights of a lien creditor with respect to the property preempt section 9-310A. Two, list any statute covering automobiles, trailers, mobile homes, boats, farm tractors, or the like, which provide for a security interest to be indicated on the certificate of title as a condition of result of perfection and any non-uniform commercial code central filing statute. So here we're introduced to the non-UCC, right? And so they're talking about automobiles, trailers, mobile homes, boats, farm tractors, or the like, all right, um, where these could be uh, in a non-UCC filing, okay? Now, 
A statute of another jurisdiction which provides, and we're number three, a statute of another jurisdiction which provides for a security interest to be indicated on a certificate of title as a condition or result of the security interest obtaining priority over the rights of a lien creditor with respect to the property. So let's take a look at that again. A statute of another jurisdiction which provides for security interest to be indicated on a certificate of title as a condition or result of the security interest obtaining priority over the rights of a lien creditor with respect to the property. So if we really get to the bottom of understanding what it means when we own our certificate of live birth and it is authenticated and we've conveyed it into a different jurisdiction or a foreign jurisdiction, which a trust could be a foreign jurisdiction. Um, businesses, I mean, it, it's up to you on how you want to do it. Um, the best route would just be to, to make sure that you are authenticating that uh, certificate of live birth and, and holding it in possession with the affidavit expressing the ownership of that birth certificate. This is where everything starts, okay? Now, this just laid out the lines of perfection of security interest in property, all right? So a certificate of title is being expressed here as it being property, okay? Now, let's take a look at 9-313. And this one is titled, when possession by or delivery to secured party perfects the security interest without filing. So, when we take possession, when, when we receive the final um, authentication from the Department of State and we receive that, us receiving it is now placing it in our possession, which actually perfects that security interest without filing it. All that's now needed is the affidavit of ownership according to Rule 220 the affidavit of ownership uh, expressing who is in possession of it and a notary and a witness to, uh, to confirm the like. Okay? Now let's take a look at C. Okay? Where it says collateral in possession of person other than debtor. Now if we understand the debtor to be our uh, fictitious corporation name and that means that we would be the other person, all right? So collateral uh, in per possession of person other than debtor. Now, with respect to collateral other than certificated securities and goods covered by a document, a secured party takes possession of collateral in the possession of a person other than the debtor, the secured party or a lessee of the collateral from the debtor in the ordinary course of the debtor's business when, one, the person in possession authenticates a record acknowledging that it holds possession of the collateral for the secured party's benefit. So if we are the secured party and we are holding it in trust, right? that's the other party or that's the person who is taking possession right? under our authority. Remember, the name, the all caps name that's on there is the debtor. So once we've taken possession and authenticated that record, it is now the secure, it is for the benefit of the secure party and it is um, it's perfected under that, the fact that it is in possession. And in two states, the person takes possession of the collateral after having authenticated a record acknowledging that it will hold possession of collateral for the secure party's benefit. Okay? And so, so here we see that with the collateral, um, if it's a certificate of live birth, possession of the authenticated, authenticated record is a uh, uh, perfection in the security interest of that. All that's needed after that, according to Rule 220, is the affidavit of ownership attached to it. Um, B reads something really interesting as well, which is goods covered by a certificate of title. With respect to goods covered by a certificate of title issued by this state, a, second, uh, a secured party may perfect the security interest in the goods by taking possession of the goods only in the circumstances de described. Okay, so we're talking certificate of title issued by this state um, and the state could be uh, your state that you're in or even if it was the District of Columbia, right? We're taking the possession of ownership of it and um, that perfects the security interest in those goods, right? The certificate of title is covering goods. And so what we have to, to, to reprogram our mind and really begin to think about is like, man, the way that the UCC is breaking down the certificate of live birth is, is breaking it down in, in a way in which it is um, 
goods that are covered, a certificate uh, uh, title. Um, as you see, we move further. Uh, it's also in, in lines with tangible chattel paper and negotiable documents, right? So there's a lot more that's uh, entwined with that uh, certificate of live birth than what meets the eye and what we've actually been exposed to, you know, um, on a public level on just a regular basis, you know. And so this is the reason why I'm putting this video out is so that, you know, we can really get to the bottom and understand, you know, um, ways in which we can really utilize the full faith and credit aspect of that birth certificate, that certificate of live birth, all right, and, and be able to correct our standing in law and make sure that we are in control, all right, and in possession of, um, of, that, of, that, of, that, of that entity, okay? Now, let's continue on. Now, just for a breakdown of steps that can be taken, all right, so here's the definition of authentication. This is just a law and legal definition. Authentication is testimony by a proper party that a document is what it is purported to be and that the party attesting to it is qualified to do so. And some of the requirements for authentication may include, one, it's signed before a notary public. Two, certified by the clerk of the court of the county in which the document is commissioned. Three, certified by the Secretary of State of the state in which the document is executed. Now, I'm in Illinois, and so our certification process with the Secretary of State would be the apostille, right? That is, uh, that is what that is, and this is what that looks like. Me. All right, so this is just uh, another document that I had a uh, court order, so I just need to make sure that I got that uh, apostille done. And so this is just the apostille that was done by the Secretary of State here in Illinois. They attached their seal to it, and they attached um, the certificate as well to the document. Um, all seals, number four, all seals and signatures must be originals, okay? And so what is happening is once we authenticated we are actually converting it into the original right this the this uh, signature of Jesse White is on here um, on the birth certificate itself um, it has the parties that are all um, that constituted the birth certificate and then you will see this uh, on the final level when we send it to the Department of State and this is step five when they send that back you will see the signature on there on top of it from the Department of State and you'll see statements on there where it's constituting, um, according to Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution, it states full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And so you now have an authenticated, fully authenticated from the county level to the state level to the federal level. They are attaching their seals and their signature stating that this document is official. Now that makes that to become the original. So now you are the holder in due course of that instrument, all right? This is why this is very important. Being holder in due course is everything. And when we're talking about negotiable instruments, I mean, being holder in due course is, is pivotal, okay? So, I, I'm, I know this may be a lot, and this is why we're just going through it, and I encourage everyone to, um, to study up and do their own research within the UCC, uh, the Uniform Commercial Code, um, uh, Section 9, starting with 310, going through to uh, 314, and just really breaking down the understanding of why we must hold um, our titles and perfect our security interest in these, uh, in these documents. Now, I have a book that I was actually studying, and I'm going to recommend for anyone who's wanting to understand uh, secure transactions. So, Article 9 is all about secure transactions. And what I've come to find out from reading this book is that just because we paid for something or we think we paid for something and you know we may have received the title, that's not it. I mean, there's still ways people can, can put liens on and, and uh, establish a better security interest in your property that you may have paid for. And so the way that we um, avoid that is by making sure that we understand how to authenticate our records, our titles, and perfect our security interest in it from anyone else being able to lay claim to it, okay? The future is for those who prepare today, for those who plan and plant, 
sacrifice and envision limitless possibilities and security for the ones they love the most. Let time work for you, because with Money Trunk, money does grow on trees. So let's get into the process on what we need to actually get this done. So if you are here watching this second video and you've already grabbed your certificate of live birth from the instructions that I gave in the first one, kudos to you. And you're going to need that now. So now you have that. The first step will be to go to your uh, the internet and go to the Secretary of State, whichever state you're in. I'm in Illinois, and so what I do is a Google search and just type in Apostille and certifications, uh, and in Illinois, and it brings me to the Illinois Cyber Drive website, where it's talking about authenticating documents for use in foreign nations. All right, and so it has the Apostille and certificates, and I'm going to then click on an application for authentication. And what it will bring up is the sheet that you would need to fill out. Now, you can either go in in person and do this, or you can mail it off. I've actually done it both. Um, I've done times where I just mail things in. Um, if I can't get downtown, or if I can go downtown and I have the time to do it, I'll walk it right in. It's, it's maybe about a 15-minute um, wait, if that, when you go into the, um, to get the, uh, the apostille. Now, first thing you'll notice is that when you're reading on the document, it says application for authentication, apostille, certifying documents for foreign use. All right. Prior to submitting documents to be certified for foreign use, please ensure they have been notarized by an Illinois notary public or certified by the proper official. Now, our certificate of live births are coming from the Illinois Department of Public Health or wherever, whatever state you're in. Your certificate of library is coming from some state agency, all right? So it has the proper official um, signature on it. Um, and then you'll notice, at, at least on our Illinois form, it says birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, all of these can be apostilled. Divorce decrees, diplomas, transcripts, you know, um, anything that a notary has actually signed off on or um, anything that a notary has put their seal to could be uh, authenticated on the state level. So... We see the fee here for our state um, is $2 per document, payable to the Secretary of State. You're going to fill out your name. You'll put the street address where you want them to, uh, to send it back. Um, your city, your state, your zip code, telephone number, email. Um, if you want to put home address, you can. P.O. Box is fine, too. All right, this is just uh, a way in which they can get in contact. All right. Um, it says country or countries you need the document certified for. Um, the country I use is Taiwan, okay? Um, Taiwan is really good with, uh, with business and, and, and trade and um, is not part of the Hague Convention. And Taiwan is also a major importer, uh, a place where we can import things from. So to me, it just makes sense. I know some people were using Jamaica before. Um, and I think it was one other one. I, I can't remember if it was China or, or not, but I know that people were using Jamaica. Um, I'm not sure if Jamaica is still part of that, if, if you can still use that. But I know um, I'm very successful with using Taiwan. It's not part of the Hague Convention. And so you could just look up a list of uh, countries that are not part of the Hague and use one of those. Uh, because what will happen is if you use, let's say you use Morocco or you use um, uh, another country that is recognized by the Hague, then what they will say is that, oh, when you send it to the Department of State, they'll say, oh, your state level is good enough. And then you won't get the final um, federal authentication. And what we need is the federal authentication. That way it's authenticated on all three levels. Okay? Three is that magic number. Now, um, make sure you use a country that is not part of the Hague Convention. That way the federal, uh, the Department of State will go ahead and attach their, um, their seal to it. Okay? And then you have to understand that you need to include a postal money order. And with your postal money order, it should be made out for $2. And so if you're sending the county record with it and the certificate of live birth, then you're going to need to send a $4 post postal money order. Okay? And the postal money order should be made out to, it should be payable to Secretary of State. All right. Now, once we have that, we have our, um, this is for illustration purposes. Once we have our birth certificate, so you have your certificate of live birth and you have the actual birth certificate. All right. 
we're going to take our envelope. We'll place that in the envelope, the birth certificate, the postal money order made out to the Secretary of State, and we also are going to need a return envelope. Okay. Now, I normally use the priority um, mailing envelopes as my return envelopes because I can get a, a priority mail stamp just to attach that. It's like a $7.35 uh, $7 stamp. They'll attach it to it. Um, I have it made out. They give me a, a pre-tracking uh, uh, stamp so I can track it as well. That way, once this gets to the Secretary of State and they, they do all the authentications that they need to do to it, they just put it in here and they drop it in the mail and it's already uh, postage is already prepaid. Okay? So, you're going to need to include the postage and the return envelope. You're going to need to include the birth record itself. All right, so let's pretend that this is a birth record and it has not been um, apostilled yet. We're going to include that. We would need a, let's say that this is a, let's say that, we'll use this as, this is my postal money order. I would include this with it for $4 because I'm getting two, uh, two records authenticated or apostilled. And then we would need to print out our application form. And all of those are going to the same place. We put, package all of that into our big envelope here, address it to where it's going, and for if you are in Illinois, it is the Illinois um, Secretary of State Index Department. That is 17 North State Street, comma, Suite 1010, Chicago, Illinois, 60602. All right? And so they will receive it. They will go ahead and apostill it, and they'll send it back. And once it comes back in this envelope, which has already been prepaid by you, It'll come back looking like this. All right. Let me go ahead and show that. Let me cover it up real quick. All right. So it'll come back looking like this. All right. I have the seal, the state of Illinois, and it'll be your birth record. Okay. Now, once that is done, that's the first part. All right. So we got the birth record. It has the official seals on it. Then we apostilled it. Now that has those seals on it. And our final step is to then go to the Department of State website and download the form DS4194 okay and all these forms should be showing up on the screen and we're just gonna go through it so it says request for authentication service we're gonna input our name alright last name comma first name comma the middle initial then the email address if you want to include your email address so that uh, if they need to contact they can uh, working phone number uh, I use my cell phone number um, case type, you really don't have to check anything there. Um, formal mailing address, include that. We're on the country. I normally don't fill that one out. I just put my formal mailing address. I mean, the country, you can put in the uh, United States of America or just America. Um, we're not receiving on be, uh, behalf of anyone else, so we don't have to put that. Let's see. So you could check, no, we're not submitting or retrieving this uh, on behalf of another individual. Um, if you were, then you would just check yes, and you would put their name. Um, delivery method. This is normally where I go straight to. All right. Um, you put in, if you're sending it USPS, you, you check that, and you will select USPS or um, self-addressed stamped envelope. I will put that. Specify, you can put the tracking number or you can put priority mail. I normally put priority. You could put the tracking number right underneath it. Let's see, the shipping address. This is where it, they're going to be shipping it to once it's done. Make sure you fill that out with your current address. All right? Or if it's the same as above, you just check that box and, and they'll know it's the same as above. Now, country. Make sure you put Taiwan or whichever one is not part of the Hague Convention. Number of documents, however many you're doing. So if we if we got two apostilled, then we're going to do two um, two documents that are going to be authenticated on the federal level. Document type, we're going to select birth certificate. All right? You'll see that that's already in there. Birth certificate and total number of documents. This is the last thing we're going to do. We're going to put two, and we know according to this the website that it is eight dollars per authentication so the estimated cost would be sixteen dollars so we need to make sure we have a, a postal money order for sixteen dollars to include this package and we're going to do the same thing right we're going to take 
our return envelope. We're going to pay for the, uh, the shipping on this, which is $7.35. Get that stamp put on there. Boom. We're going to make sure we fill it out that it's coming uh, from the Department of State, because remember, this is what they're going to be sending back to us. So from the U.S. Department of State, um, the address I will show on screen. And this is going to, they're going to mail it to you, whatever your address is, okay? That's what this is. This is our return address. We're going to make sure we have our $16 postal money order made out to the Department of State. All right. 